Manticore Tales, short stories by Nicholas LaCalfi. The Founder's Armchair He sat in the massive armchair that was the focal point of the room. It did not beg for attention like the hand-drawn paintings on the wall. It did not need to be picked up and admired like the physical books on the shelves. Surely no one would light it on fire to enjoy it like the humidor cigars. In a room of off-world luxuries and antiques, the conglomerate founder chose this chair to be his respite from the chaos of his world. Upon entering the private lounge, the chair drew attention like a black hole. The back stood firm with an ergonomic slant so one could relax but would not doze off. The arms were well padded and comfortable for elbows and the occasional grandchild who snuck in to play after slinking past the nanny's watch. The chair was a dark maroon red that accented the orange firelight that burned before it. It had wings near the head that acted as blinders for a man that was just the right height, and the conglomerate founder was just the right height. His success in business and colonization had afforded him countless luxuries like private starships with captain's chairs and suites of comfort. He has palaces on three of the five planets he owns, and a fourth is under construction. But this chair, with its genuine wood legs carved into claws holding orbs, is where he finds peace and relaxation. It sits in a modest apartment on his home world. The world where the central system was founded, where he signed up to be an officer in the Imperial Wars, and he was given command of a modest mining fleet that he employed to make him his fortune. This modest home could only hold half his extended family, and the wait staff barely breaks two dozen, but that keeps things quiet for him. Some who see it assume the chair is an heirloom, passed down from a grandfather when he came to this world from off-planet and settled in a tiny three-room apartment. He humors some with that story, or tells of a craftsman that made it upon his arrival to some far-off world. Only he and his accountant know the truth. There are a few thousand in existence in a storage bunker on this world. For the chair wears out like anything else, and a new one is delivered in an inconspicuous box when the cushions feel a little too soft. And every few months, he unboxes this perfect chair, pristine and always new, by design. In memory of Tally Rushing. Talita Rushing, or Tally, as her schoolyard friends called her, died at the age of 142 last night. She was in an unfortunate car accident with a tree on the edge of her ranch, a tree she planted with her grandfather to commemorate the passing of his wife. Tally was a pillar of the community and was among the first generation of children born on Piccadillium, the planet we call home. She was the daughter of a mechanic, and her father was an honest vat farmer. She watched the cities grow out of the ground, as she described it in many town meetings, and was a strong advocate for every Piccadillium citizen receiving land they could call their own. We have so much space here, and the administrators of the central system build towers so they can live in boxes? Between 13256 and 13266 HE, or Piccadillium year 26 to 37, she won the colony's Best Pie Award eight times at the annual Piccadillium Fair now renamed First Founders Fair, since countless fairs are hosted around the globe. The pictures and bows of her first-place victories hang above her homestead hearth with pride. No visitor could leave Tally's home without hearing about the secret recipe her grandma left her and the travesty of letting off-world ingredients into the competition. She was never a conservationist, Tally's granddaughter Joanna told us. She welcomed administrators with open arms and baked goods. Grandma just had a love for Piccadillium life and wanted to share it. Her passing comes at a tumultuous time for the first founder and Piccadillium community. Proposal 31B3, which will designate building permits for three new administrative cities, is up for approval in less than one week. These cities promise to bring new trade into Piccadillium and cement its place as an up-and-coming trade hub in the central system. Tally was an advocate against this proposal, claiming, We have a fine way of life here on Piccadillium, 
they can administrate from the moons and satellites if needed, but taking up beautiful land that Piccadillium citizens should enjoy is a travesty. This proposal affected Tally directly, as it would expropriate over half her family's land. It's not giving up the land that bothers me, Tally recently stated at a town hall meeting. I'd happily give it up to any Piccadillium citizen. But to house more admins that complicate our planet's way of life? No thank you. Tally fought her whole life to maintain the natural beauty of Piccadillium because there aren't many planets like it anymore. Close friend and founder city mayor Harriet Klein said, Our ancestors worked hard to make a life on this planet, and we should respect that by not giving it away to off-world bureaucrats. Without Tally's strong voice, many citizens are concerned by the conglomerate and admin influx. Her family requests that in lieu of pies and flowers, you vote against the upcoming proposal. Founding News, 5th Shin, 172, Piccadillium Year. <laughs> muck and Miscreants I remember wading through the streets with muck on my boots and neon lights buzzing in my ears. Hordes of people flowed past me as if they were fish in the stream, merely following the current while I defied them and their conventions. After what I'd done, it was no shock that I felt like a heretic. I wore the collar of my stained brown trench coat high to hide the scars, not that anyone in the street was interested in anything other than getting home with their dinner, taking off their dirty shoes, and resting before another day struck them. I was interested in much the same, but my prospects were looking worse by the minute. The smell of the sea and fishmongers' wares still pummeled my nostrils, filling my mind with their pungency. The random cries of products for sale and the locals' bastardized dialect of common tongue still startled me since I had no way to filter the noise out. I wanted nothing more than to be off the streets and get some quiet for my new senses. I turned down a short alley and knocked on the scrap metal door. A thin piece of corrugated metal that time and sea air ate away at the edges. Its hinges squeaked as the innkeeper peeked through the slit she'd made. You want what? She asked. I kept my head down and angled my body so my good eye faced her. Room for the night, please? Mixing the order of my words to try to sound like a citizen of the city would only confuse both of us. I have credits, I added, as she looked at me dubiously. No trouble, she said. At first, my heart fluttered with hope. When she didn't open the door any further, I slowly realized I'd missed a cue. My old implants would have informed me that this was a question, not a statement. Her irritated voice, repeating the message with squinted eyes, prodded me to respond. No, I'm no trouble. I have credits. I gave her my best smile, the left side of my mouth twisted from where they removed the sub-localizer. No manticores. The squeak of the door closing was short, and the staccato of the latch punctuated her statement. Despite having the same natural cognition as everyone else here, I was not welcome. The scales had fallen from my eyes, and the overlay text and video had gone with them. I was far from a manticore now, but still as despised as a tax collector. However, it was the right thing for her to do. Giving me a bed could ruin her reputation in the city, or worse, pit her against the conglomerate that ruled this planet. The same conglomerate that fired me for reporting accurate census data to the central system. That action had gone against the conglomerate's best interests. Soon, a minister judge would be out to evaluate and hopefully improve the living conditions of these citizens assuming my former colleagues didn't misreport other numbers first. They charged me with misallocation of equipment, citing that I'd over-ordered meal rations, an act that everyone did at some point. On a station with standard rations, this could lead to the starvation of the crew. However, unlike the city around me, our station was overflowing with meals, equipment, and space. I lost my position and implants, leaving me with the biological standards and scars on half my face. My meat memory is no computer and is flawed with inaccuracies and gaps, but I remember this moment at the end door better than the painful uninstallation surgery or the slap of the fish breeze at the landing shuttle's doorway. I'm still shocked that my unenhanced ears noticed the door squeaking back open. A young boy's face peeked out. Two doors down and an alleyway away. They take your credits and face. The innkeeper angrily shouted at him, and he slinked away, latching the door closed. I hoped his punishment was less than mine. Thanks to the little miscreant boy, my prospects of a quiet bed had improved. Hey, thanks for watching and making it to the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you enjoyed it, consider liking, 
and or subscribing to the channel. I appreciate both. I want to thank my patrons who helped make this possible. If I did things right, their names should be showing up on the screen right now. I'm excited to announce that I just released a book called A Trial of Rock and Rope. It's available as an ebook on Amazon. It's also available in paperback. And if you're part of Kindle Unlimited, it's there as well. It's about Perrin, who's stuck in the afterlife with a rock tied to his ankle, and he has to make it to the top of a mountain in order to escape. It was a serial on the blog, and a lot of people encouraged me to turn it into a book. I'm really excited to see it out in the world. There will be a link to pick it up in the description if you're interested. Until next time, remember to look both ways before you step into the road.